Welcome into ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitra coming up on today's show. How does Nolan Smith and Killy Ringo sound in the first two rounds? Well, they actually took down the Giant on Tuesday, but the Hawks are going to have to take down the Giant four more times to get it done. And last but not least, and for the culture, it looks like Dan Snyder will have a nice going away gift. That's all coming up next right here on ATL Day Ones. Let's go. This is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. I want to start off by saying thank you for making ATL Day Ones your first listen of the day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast and wherever you download your podcast. Make sure that you leave a five-star review. Really appreciate that from you in advance. ATL Day Ones, your team every day. Today's episode of ATL Day Ones is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. But T, when you think about all of the mock drafts that we've been going through or we've checked out throughout the years, one of the ones that always kind of gets a little bit of more attention is our guy, Mel Kuyper, um, has put out his mock draft. And he was speaking to Atlanta media the other day, and he said something that I thought that was kind of interesting. He said that the Falcons should look at Nolan Smith in the first round and Keely Ringo. In the second round, when you think about all of the the uh, quote unquote rumors or, or narratives that have gone with the Falcons and who they draft, Georgia Bulldogs has been one that has been talked about for for quite some time, and how they don't draft Georgia football players. But do you see a scenario where they actually draft two consecutive Georgia players in, in, in this upcoming draft? A little bit less than two weeks away. Hey, that to me seems a little questionable only because I'm wondering, okay, so if we look at Keely Smith as an example, excuse me, Keely Ringo as yeah. an example, mm -hmm. yes, you could you could definitely see a scenario where he'd be a quality player to draft, but for what reason and where? Because if he goes first late round, like that's very key. Where? Uh, yeah, if he goes <laughs> yes. first round, are you like, are you moving up in the draft? Like, are you taking that 44th pick and moving up somewhere into that late first round to get him? And you essentially just kind of have rounded out, for lack of a better term, your secondary? I guess that's where my question would be on what would be that rationale. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people still think, in, despite, and I'm, and again, I'm, I'm putting, using that term, like rounded out the secondary, right? Right. A lot of people have said, hey, Although the Falcons went out and got Jeff Okuda, they're still not convinced that the Falcons won't even go corner at number eight. Like there are right. some people, you know, there's still some pundits that are still out there saying that. But I guess that's where it starts for me, where I'm wondering, where does that happen? Because, again, you still have two true positions of need, right? Right. Still, you still have two positions, two true positions of need on the defense as well as on the offense, not named the secondary. Not named yeah. the secondary. So I think yep. that's the first place that that I would start is the make kind of scratching my head as to, okay, if he's projected to be a late first rounder, how and where do, do the Falcons pick him pick him up? And I'll I'll dig into you know I I second what you said about Keely Ringo because I'm not that high on him. I don't think that you know I think he can be a starter in the NFL, but I don't think he's that next level elite level uh, guy that's going to take your secondary to the next level or, or solidify your secondary or sure up your secondary that the Falcons need. I don't think he's that type of player to, to bring in. And like you said, if he, he's going to go first round because you're just looking at the measurables and how, yep. how fast he runs. Like people are going to take a chance on him in, the, in that first round. The yeah. SEC, you know, that's the, that's the, he has too many stamps of approval to fall into the second round, especially at 44. So I don't see how that goes, but I'm going to go dig into this whole Nolan Smith piece because now, yeah. now I think that I'm not surprised that Nolan Smith won the room at, at, mm -hmm. during the, at the combine. Like if you talk to Nolan Smith, like, you'll let him date your daughter. You'll draft him because he's a dog. You know he's going to be able to, you know, go 
go out there and give it give his all if you tra- uh, take a chance on him because the, and the interesting thing about that is that you know it's hard to find players that are that are that fall into both of those categories. A guy that really seems like he's good to be around, a guy, a super locker room guy, and a guy that can come in that you know that you're going to give 100% effort each and every time. However, I kind of have I have a, a couple of reservations because he's the type of guy that, you know, he has the athletic ability. I knew that before he even ran the, ran the 4-3, right? I, I, I knew that he's, he's going to win a room at the combine, but – my whole thing is on Saturdays, there were times where I'm sitting up here watching my television. I'm just like, where's Nolan Smith? <laughs> like, where is Nolan Smith? Is he playing today? Is he out there? Did he, is he on the field? Because what the thing that we've always seen, you know, when it comes to Georgia, like these guys have had, there's plenty of talent on Georgia that you pay attention to. And I don't think that just because you have other talent on it, that means that somebody else isn't going to shine. Because even those guys with Devontae Wyatt and all of those guys winning the first round last year and Jordan Davis, like Jalen Carter stood out to me on the film of those guys. When those guys were on the film, when Nolan Smith disappearing like I feel like he does from mm-hmm. time to time on film, I just don't see him being a worthy of a top ten pick. That's just my whole opinion, T. And I think that – if the Falcons were to take him at, at that at spot, I feel like that'd be a reaching. That'll be a reach for me. That'll be a reach for me. And I think in agreeing with you on that, because you literally are saying either eight with him or you're saying 44. Really, you're not saying 44 because you would essentially he's being projected in the mid rounds. Right. Right. So exactly. He would yeah. be available to you if in the scenario that a lot of uh, people have been playing out, including ourselves, a lot of pundits have been playing out, is the scenario of the Falcons uh, trading back, if you will. Yes, now, absolutely. Right. Now, he could, he could potentially be there, but again, like you said, I don't know if he's that guy, and I know there are many others whom you think might be there and who might be more viable at that space. For example, Keon White. Yep. So, in, in, in terms of what Keon White brings to the table versus Nolan Smith, I mean, I know that probably makes a lot of dogs fans cringe at the Mm -hmm. thought but he is someone who may be actually more viable there and then we look at the fact that okay you know just kind of going back to you know that bigger picture if you will right then it all depends too on how the board how the board falls yes honestly you can say nolan smith is a mid-rounder and he might be late first round you just never know how the board shapes out so a lot of it is also to be determined, which is yes. crazy to be talking about less than two weeks out from the draft. But we know that when you're talking about a top five or a top 10 slot like the Falcons have, anything, anything can still happen. Yeah, we don't we don't we don't know how that's going to fall. But I do I do feel like, you know, having those two guys in those particular uh, slots, I'll I'll be I will question those picks. Uh, as much as I w- it would be cool to see those guys play have black and red uniforms on again in the NFL, I still like, I don't know about that one, Terry and Arthur. But, you know, we will definitely see. And like you said, we are less than two weeks away from the draft, T. And you know we're going to have to drop our ATL Day 1's mock draft. It's coming. It's coming. I promise you. It's coming. I'm working on my stuff. I'm about to get in the lab, T. I'm about to see what's going on. So, we're going to – you guys be on the lookout for the ATL Day 1's mock draft. Now, speaking of on being on the lookout for things, how about this? We might need to be on the lookout for Mr. Von Grissom T because we just learned yesterday that Orlando Arcia is going on the IL. Now, initially, they did the x-rays. They saw no fractures, but as they did a little bit more digging and everything like that, a 98-mile-per-hour mile fastball, it's pretty hard to not uh, uh, touch something. So we, they did find out. That that he did it was like a micro factor, and they were going to put him on the IL. I think it's a ten day IL, I believe. And it looked the Braves haven't announced it just yet, but it looks like Von Grissom is going to get the call up. T. And given how this situation went down, as far as Orlando Arcia winning the job and starting to do really well, like literally winning games for them in walk off fashion, <laughs> and, and and when you think about Von Grissom, 
you know, going down to the AAA. And, and you know what? Like, you know, being at, in RC, you're doing well. And you see Vaughn Grissom, you know, he's doing well down there. But we didn't really plan on seeing him this early. Being that that's the case, T, do you feel like Grissom will be ready to make this this transition into the uh, into the, the shortstop position right now? Because this situation is a little different from last year. Indeed. And, and so it's interesting because we, if I think about it, honestly, I think he's prepared. And maybe because of what you mentioned, mm -hmm. he's now had the opportunity to think about what it looked like for him last year and how he was able to come in and just, at, at least at the beginning of his call up, he was able to just be lights out, right? And then right. all of a sudden, you're looking like you're that guy. You're training with Ron Washington. He's giving you kudos. And it looks like everything's a go, all green lights for you to be the starter, except you're not on right. opening day. I felt like the commentary that he gave, I think one of the uh, references was like a Mickey Mantle reference, if you will, of him going down and then coming back up and what he looked like in his sort of second go round. I believe that Vaughn Grissom is mature enough to understand and appreciate and be prepared for the moment. In other words, wow, I kind of thought I was there. They kind of didn't think I was there. But now I have the opportunity to show them that I'm ready to be there. So, yeah, I, I just think ultimately speaking, mentally, I think that he understood why he had to take that step back, if you will. And he was able to do so and, and be OK. And thank goodness for Sam Hilliard kind of filling in the gaps, you know, kind of like, um, you know, here and there, what have you, uh, just as an example. Um, and, and I'm giving the example of like him being the guy who can you can kind of place him here there and everywhere the reason i'm talking about him is mm -hmm. because if for some reason von grissom is not ready yep. shows us that he's not ready not that you are completely confident in a brayton shoemake but i'm just going back to what we always say about the braves and that right. is the fact that alex anthopoulos and brian snicker always have a plan i think von grissom knows that so yep. if you want to be the plan maybe you're the plan earlier than we thought you were going to be but if you want to be the plan then I think you absolutely have an opportunity to show that you are the plan when you get in that first game of this season at the major level tonight. Yeah, and I think that when you look at it, T, he's been killing it down at AAA. What, yes, like three sixty six? Yeah, right? and at one he point was batting killing. over four hundred. Right. Yeah. So he, I feel like he'll be up for the task because, you know, looking back at the situation with Arcia being named the starter, you kind of mm -hmm. look at it from. A Von Grissom standpoint, and I'm not right reading his mind, but I feel like he's probably saying to himself, you know what? That was a little embarrassing. I'm about to show y'all why. It's humbling. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's humbling. very humbling. Very humbling. And I think that once you get that humble experience and, and you respond accordingly by, by doing really well where you are, where they placed you, I, I think Von Grissom is going to do nothing but succeed. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, the Braves plan for him to come in at some point I think it's going to come to fruition. And we know, hey, Alex Anthopoulos knows what the hell he's doing. Hey. And you don't want Harry Adrianza <laughs> or Shoemake coming up the rear. No. Uh, you, you, because you you just mentioned it. You you want to talk about humbling? Would you like to be called up for a couple games and then have to go back down? Probably no, not. So, yeah, this is the opportunity. Not. But I do think just in meeting him and having an opportunity to speak with him last season, he is a bit wise beyond his years. So I think – he will have appreciated the experience of having to go down there thinking he was going to be the starter on opening day. I think he's ready. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree. And speaking of wise, how about this? We need you to be wise and go out and get yourself a built bar because if you're looking for a delicious snack, but don't want all of the sugar and the calories, then you need to go get this best tasting protein bar ever. That's built. You got to try it because when you think about, you know, protein bars, sometimes those things get a little chalky and they just taste terrible. And, you know, they might say, oh, yeah, they're good for you, but they don't taste good. No, not Built Bar. They got everything right now. Why do they taste so good? How about this? For starters, they are covered in 100 percent real dark chocolate. Right. That's real chocolate. So even they have the best flavors for you. They have the churro, the peanut butter brownie, and the cookies and cream. And guess what? You know you've been going to Built.com to order and, and get get your orders, and they come right there to your doorstep. How about this? If you like to be a in person, like I can get like that sometimes, and you want to go pick it up yourself, how about this? You can go to 
Walmart right now and go get you a four pack. Or you can even go to Sam's Club and grab a 13 bar box. And it got all the hit flavors, the brownie butter puff, which is absolutely amazing. I've had that before and the churro puff. So yeah, so right now, I want you to go to get yourself a built bar today. Well, it's about that time, Jarvis. Yes. And like you said, the fans should have their built bars ready. Now, whether they're going to be eating them in celebration tomorrow evening or whether they're going to be eating them because they're stressed out tomorrow evening, who knows? Because we don't know which 41 the Hawk team is going to show up, right? We hope yes. that it's the 41 win Hawk team that we yes. also saw Tuesday evening and literally really made an exclamation point down in South Beach. Or we're going to see the other one. To me, it's very interesting because the commentary has been, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about something I, I heard Sadiq Bay mention, as well as uh, DeJounte Murray mentioned, and kind of feed off of that. But the Boston Celtics have been an interesting nemesis for the Hawks because the Hawks have gotten close yeah. every single game, unfortunately. Did not beat them this season, but they've been close in all three games, right? So mm -hmm. you look back, now we're in a different space. We've got Quinn Snyder, who's now been there, and we're starting to see signs that what he's implementing is starting to work. Yes. Trey Young is starting to understand the assignment a little bit better when teams bring that trap D on him. And we cannot say enough about the bench mob 2.0 and what they've been able to do, especially showing up on the road when the Hawks needed it most. But do you feel that it's a group or a person or even a philosophy which one do you think is going to be the most important in terms of the Hawks establishing themselves and competing in this series? Wow. I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to go with a group and I'm going to put DeJounte Murray and Trey Young in that same group. Right. And, and here's why, because I think that how teams defend Trey in the playoffs is going to be huge as to how they respond, because we know if they are going to trap Trey, like, Trey needs to know how to be able to um, respond to that accordingly, right? Getting the ball out of his hands and getting it to the right person and then making sure once he gets it out of his hands, he just doesn't go stand behind the three-point line and just go chill and, 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 and create some motion and, and run that offense that, that Quinn Snyder wants to run because I think that, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, DeJounte Murray was traded for was because they needed somebody who can handle the rock too. And not only when Trey was off the court, but when he's on the court and teams start to play him just like Miami Heat, because Miami Heat gave the blueprint, right? And you've yes. seen team from time from uh, uh, time in, at night in and night out, throw that trap D at Trey, and how he responded was basically was going to determine whether or not they were going to win that game. So I think I'm going to go with the group, with DeJounte Murray and Trey Young, and making sure that – once that ball comes out of your hand, come out of Trey's hands and goes into DeJounte's hands or whoever hands it goes into, making sure that they're moving it, continue to move the ball and find the open man because that ball movement piece, that's a philosophy. I guess I'm, I'm giving you two answers here. That's a philosophy of moving the rock and, and making sure DeJounte Murray and Trey Young are making good decisions with the basketball. Yeah. And I'm going to go with philosophy as well as for my number one, because if I look into the numbers, the offensive rebounding from game one that they played with the Celtics yes. against the Celtics earlier in the season and game two and specifically game three, even though we all know those were kind of your second units that were out there. But still, the offensive rebounding looked like night and day. And we mm -hmm. know that the reason for that is Quinn Snyder. So I'll, I'll kind of put philosophy slash Quinn Snyder, but I think Indeed. it's that philosophy of understanding the importance of getting after it, getting after the boards and making sure that the Celtics do not have an opportunity to get back down the court. Second chance points has been the Hogs bread and butter of late when they yep. have not been able to get it done, especially beyond the arc, which in all three Celtics games, they really did not have a good game from beyond the arc where they've been able to make a difference is, Hey, we know that a long rebound could be coming. We're going to get it. Or we know that even if it's a point blank shot, somebody could actually still miss it. So let's be under that basket and let's be waiting for that basket so that we can get that easy tip in. It's that philosophy of understanding the importance of battling on the boards. And for everybody, despite the fact that Clint Capella had 21 rebounds in the game, in the win against the Heat, the biggest thing for me, Jarvis, was that everybody, 
everybody had at least one rebound. That's the most important thing. If I can go up and down the nine man rotation and I can see some battling on the boards, to me, that philosophy is going to be key because you're not going to necessarily beat them from, from distance. They've yeah. gotten you there pretty much every single game. But where you have been inching up and getting closer to them is your field goal percentage. That's improved. Your offensive rebounding, that's improved. And your second chance points, that's improved. So if you have an opportunity to go for second chance points, guess who doesn't have the ball, Jarvis? Jason Tatum. Guess who doesn't have the ball? Jalen Brown. Guess who doesn't have the ball? Some rando off the bench to beat you from the three-point line. So that's to me, that's the philosophy. And also going back to your point, I want to just second it as my, that's my one A. And then maybe my one B would be uh, the same as yours, which would be your backcourt and making sound basketball decisions. Like we're starting to see Trey make when that three point shot is not there, you know, just make the Celtics make decisions. And why do I say it that way? Because DeJounte Murray, he's to me, he's going to make the Celtics make decisions because He uses his basketball. You don't get to his spot. Yeah, exactly. And even when the stats don't always show it, he's still making those good basketball decisions that are making you think, okay, I don't really know where DJ is going to go with this thing. Trey Young has to do that every single possession. He can't allow them to know that, oh, my goodness, I'm going to get trapped in the back court and I'm going to end up with five turnovers right out of the gate. Can't let them have that. Make them decide. Oh, wait a minute. Is Trey going to kick this thing out to Sadiq Bey? Is Trey going to kick this out to A.J. Griffin? Should he get, you know, inserted into the game tonight? Is he going to kick it out? Who is he going to kick this ball out to? Or is he going to try to drive the lane and get to the free throw line? Or is he going to hit us with a little floater? Is he going to do a pick and roll alley? Like, they need to be thinking all the time, Jarvis. Trey Young has to be his most unpredictable self so that he can throw the Celtics off and make them think about where he's going to go as opposed to knowing where he's going to go. I think that's going to be critical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think and I like how you put that, the unpredictable self. Under control and under yeah. unpredictable. Is that possible? Yeah, we definitely shall see. But I think that when, you know, the matchup piece is probably gonna be something that's gonna come into play as well because, you know, Derek White, I think I believe that the Boston Celtics probably throw Derek White on Trey. Yeah. And we know he's had some success from time to time with him. And I think that Trey probably will be able to take advantage of that because we know Marcus Smart and Trey getting on each other that's we, right. we know we don't need to get into that type of stuff right see, you got DeJounte Murray yes. use your weapon and ask him hey this D white dude you know Derek White has really gotten the best of me so yeah. get your tips from DeJounte Murray he's seeing him front and center he knows what Derek White's game looks like so take advantage of having somebody like DeJounte Murray there and available to be able to tell you exactly what it is that you know, you need to do in order to be able to handle whatever Derek White throws at you when, as you mentioned, he's inserted into the game. Now, speaking of being inserted into the game, our everydayers always insert themselves into the ATL Day Ones game. How and why? Because you guys drop great comments into our comment section on YouTube. You guys also tweet at us and we appreciate all that because you know what? When you make ATL Day Ones your first listen of the day, it's always the coolest thing for us to know by you acknowledging us. So everydayers know that we appreciate you. Keep bringing the comments because we read them. We react to them. You guys bring us some good information as well. So we hope to keep bringing you some good information as well. So to our everydayers, we appreciate you stopping by ATL Day Ones and really stopping by everybody on the Locked On Sports Atlanta Network. Keep doing your thing and we will keep doing ours too. Absolutely. But T, this is for the culture. It is the intersection between sports, entertainment, the culture, and sometimes whatever the hell we want to talk about. Because that's just how we get down on this show. Today is no different. When you think about the Washington Commanders, T, and the last 24 years since Dan Snyder has been the owner of this team, all I can think of is spending money frivolously on free agents and not trying to a team build, uh, investigations, federal government uh, de- depositions that he's denied and being out of the country and just workplace environment infractions. It's just been a lot of crap and stuff. Now we learned that uh, Dan Snyder has gotten an offer, $6 billion. It hasn't been finalized yet. The owner of the, the co-owner of the Philadelphia Sixers and the uh, New Jersey Devils, um, 
it has put in a bid, and this is the uh, the the bid, bid team that involves uh, Magic Johnson and Will. We talked about that and how uh, he's involved in that. And I think that there's some for me. I'm kind of torn, right? Because on one side, of, one side of me says that this is good for for the uh, for the DC area. They finally want to get somebody that they can find, possibly believe in and, and and kind of be okay with being fans of this team. But on the other side, it's like. Are these investigations going to continue? Or is this is kind of like, all right, now he's going to sell, sell the team. All right, now we're not going to hear anything about the investigations anymore. And, and that's the part that really kind of sticks in my craw because I'm just like, all right, man. Like, you about to get $6 billion to go away. I don't know if that – I like that, so to speak. I guess I can put it like that without cussing. <laughs> T, help me out here, T. <laughs> When I saw it, all I thought was, and this probably sounds so like prudish, but I'm just going to say it. I was like, <laughs> what kind of message does that send? <laughs> yes. Like you can just be evil, diabolical, do yeah. whatever in the world you want. Defiant, Defiant. is the word I would use. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to sound like a prude, but I promise you that was my first thought. Like, okay, just, I mean, how do you even tell kids to do the right thing? Well, Dan Snyder didn't do it and he's a billionaire. I mean, literally, but it just literally the only reason that dude is even being like ousted or forced out is because he knows where all the bodies are buried, right? Yes, and he's been know, survived this long, right? Yeah, We've got yeah, it's gotten to this he, point, yeah. Right, right. And, and finally, you figured out a way to like pay him six billion to go away. <sighs> just don't, God, you know, damn. Like it's it's just mind blowing. I mean, like you said, is it good for the game? Kind of, sort of. Because he's like your poster child for what a lot of others do and just don't get caught doing. Yeah. But Jarvis, six billion to go away. Do you know somebody might be able to pay? Well, you might have to pay me six hundred grand to go away. Okay, but I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I will gladly pack up my office right. and leave. <laughs> Thousand, I might tap out. Yeah, like, yeah or, you like, know, for like real, for a little yeah. while. Yeah, be honest, little little keep it funky. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for a little yeah. while, I might actually. Yeah, give, give me sixty k yeah. tax free. You know, what I'm right, right. Like, tax yeah. free. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. I'm walking out the stipulation. door. Stipulation. I want yeah. one stipulation. Exactly. I'm walking out the door with sixty, but six billion is just unbelievable. And to think that he could have remained where he wants to wants to be, which is really he still wanted to be an owner, if he didn't know where all the stinking bodies were buried. Makes yes, sense. yes, and hope, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, so keep investigating. That's why I think that's what we're saying to you. Keep yeah. investigating this man, and, and hopefully, he'll do some probation or something, whatever. Anyway, but but before we get out of here, T, got to talk about this. It's going down tomorrow, spring games, Georgia, Georgia Tech, T, Athens, the Flats, Brent Key trying to figure out how to be relevant, and Kirby Smart going for three national championships in a row. Like, how, 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 when you think about the spring game, like, how do you how are you feeling about about these spring games coming up tomorrow? And then, you know, something that you may be looking for. Yeah, actually. OK, now this is me being funny, right? Okay. Because, yeah, I'm excited for the basic things, right? The basic being let's look at what we see in the QB competition in Athens, right? Of course. And then the basic Absolutely. things, this will be Brent Key's official, official first spring game as the head coach, coach for yep. Georgia Tech. So, you know, I just kind of want to see what his philosophy is to the degree that you could actually see it in, in a spring game, right? Mm -hmm. But, okay, here's the real thing I was thinking about. Those articles that talked about spring games being like full-on games and whether or not that's actually going to come to fruition or making them like full-on games with like the whole band situation going on Ooh. and then the whole like the dancers and just like making it like a full-on game. Yeah, like a real game, yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, like, that would be so very cool if that actually came to fruition. So that's where my mind went. The, the quarterback competition mm -hmm. for UGA, seeing Brent Key in his first official, official installment of his offense and defense and special teams as the head coach for Georgia Tech. But also, with all this commentary about this Freaknik documentary <laughs> that's coming out. Sorry and about that. Have... <laughs> Yeah, Jamie went down a little rabbit hole yesterday. I had, I had some memories and stuff, you know, and stuff. So sorry, TV. Right, uh, no came across that yesterday. Please forgive me. Exactly. <laughs> like, you and 
James Walker actually <laughs> destroyed it yesterday. So I'm so not gonna go in that direction. Like completely, but my mind didn't go there. Like if you had spring games that had like some real competition and had the band straight up coming out and had the dancers and just the whole regalia of a game, like you could revisit Freaknik in some of these spring games up in Atlanta. Just saying, and that includes Morehouse's football team. I was say football team. <laughs> All the you took the words right out of my mouth because uh, yeah. I wouldn't be going to Georgia Tech if all that was going down. You know, I'm gonna be at down at AU Center. Like, as a matter of fact, they probably need to do it like a situation where hey, Morehouse plays, you know, Clark, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And then, yes. you know, they kind of, you know, do it like that and kind of, you know, do like a one versus two on each team, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, and just that have a be, big old fanfare out of that bad boy. Yes, that could add. They need to put us on a, a fundraising committee or something. Too. Like, I like that idea. That would give me some money, Clark. It would give yes. me some money, Morehouse. I would pay to see that. Shoot. People would I'll pay, pay $5. Yes. You know and you know what? Most schools already have their version of like a spring alumni weekend anyway mm -hmm. like you could really kind of roll that into mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. roll that up and make that a thing yeah I, I smell i smell where you're going to i smell you it's smelling really good we hope you're smelling really good wait a minute how about that That's for a segue we hope you're smelling good while you're listening to atl day ones really appreciate you guys for making us your first listen of the day and how about this all the people you listen to this every day the everydayers we appreciate you as well and if you are every day drop it in the comment box right down there right now right do it right now right now right now we want people to get fomo because if you aren't up every day the hell are you waiting on? Stop playing around, man. If you don't do anything else, people, all I ask that you make sure that you share love, show love, and most importantly, spread love.